Hello everyone, uh, <clears throat> those who might be joining us on Facebook Live and those who are here, uh, thanks for coming again. Uh, joint Bible study from River Life Chapel and Christ Life Inc. Uh, <clears throat> if you uh, are in Western New York and don't have a home church, uh, we certainly invite you to come Sunday mornings and join us at 10.30 um, a.m. At 3474 Creek Road in Youngstown, New York, it's River Life Chapel, and that's at 10.30 a.m. on Sunday mornings. Uh, <clears throat> and if you got a good church the Lord has led you to, make sure you get there. Uh, we need each other in the body of Christ, and so, um, you know, don't be absent from uh, whatever it is the Lord has you to provide for where he's got you plugged in. All right, we are... Um, studying the book of Job. Here we've already prayed, and so if you're watching on Facebook Live, pray and ask God to uh, give you whatever insights from this book that he wants for you to have. We are in chapter 9 of the book of Job. I'm positive we won't get through the whole chapter this time. Uh, chapter 9 has got some really cool stuff in it, um, <clears throat> and so... Towards the end of the chapter, there's an unbelievably powerful messianic prophecy that Job has. And so um, I doubt we'll get there today, but we'll see. Um, all right, so Job 9, uh, 1 through 13 is kind of the first section. Um, so if somebody wants to read, say, Job 9, 1 through 7... And then if somebody wants to read 8 through 13, that would be good. Anybody want that? 1 through 7 and 8 through 13? Well, I'll start. All right. 1 through 7. Um, then Job answered, In truth, I know that this is so. But how can a man be in the right before God? If one wished to dispute with him, he could not answer him once in a thousand times. Wise in heart and mighty in strength, who has defied him without harm? It is God who removes the mountains. I'm sorry, yeah, who removes the mountains. They know not how, when he overturns them in his anger. Who shakes the earth out of its place, and its pillars tremble? Who commands the sun not to shine, and sets a seal upon the stars? Anybody want 8 through Okay, 8 through 13. He alone made the skies, and he walks on the ocean waves. God made the bear, Orion, the Pleiades. He made the plants that cross the southern sky. He does things too marvelous for people to understand. He does too many miracles to count. When he passes by, I cannot see him. He goes right past me, and I don't notice. If he takes something away, no one can stop him. No one can say to him, what are you doing? God will not hold back his anger. Even Rahab's helpers were, are afraid of him. Okay. <clears throat> so in this section, uh, Job is starting, starting to outline in detail some of how unbelievably awesome God is. Um, and like Job's like, we can't even know him. It's just, he's unknowable. He's beyond belief, beyond comprehension. Uh, so that's kind of this section is a lot of that. He starts out in verse one or verse two. Uh, <clears throat> he says, I know he's responding to Bildad. And he says, I know it is of a truth. How should a man be just with God? Um, so he's acknowledging a little bit of what Bildad said, you know, yeah, I know, um, how can anyone be just before God? Now, last week when we looked at Bildad, we saw that he was kind of out there, uh, <clears throat> you know, even in all of his agony and anguish and, and turmoil and pain, Job is more polite than his friends, you know. He's, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, you're, I know it's true. How, could, how should a man be just with God? 
Uh, <clears throat> so he's kind of acknowledging what a little bit of what Bill Dad said, being polite, I think. Um, and um, and he says, you know, how can a man be right with God? Uh, and um, Job acknowledges some of what Bill Dad says. He basically, God does not pervert justice, which is something that Bill Dad had said, you know. So no, God doesn't pervert justice, you know. So he's he's starting out by acknowledging that. Um, <clears throat> somebody want to look up uh, Romans three, five and twenty five and twenty six. Uh, and while you're getting there, Job, verse 2, he's lamenting that it's impossible for mere man to be right before God. Uh, <clears throat> so we'll take a look at the solution to Job's dilemma. Uh, and this is, it's interesting as you go through this chapter, uh, how... He just kind of keeps pointing towards the Messiah uh, and and that. And so, you got it? Um, did you say 3.25? Yeah, Romans 3.25 and 26. Yeah. And Job's asking, how can a man be right before God? And the answer is? Yeah. Whom God displayed publicly Oops. as a propitiation yeah. in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness. Because in the forbearance of God, he has over sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. <clears throat> All right. So, uh, in Romans 3, 25 and 26, uh, it tells us, Job's like, you know, how can a man be right before God? And he's, he's starting already to cry out, and he's like, in his mind, he was good. You know, he didn't deserve what had come on him, and God verifies and validates that at the end of the book. But at the same time, even though he knows that, in, at least he, he's struggling with, he knows that, he didn't bring this on himself through a sinful lifestyle. At the same time, he knows man can't be right with God. How can, how can a man be right with God? And he talks about how awesome God is and everything. And so he, this that's a little bit of a hint kind of to me that, you know, it's like, God, you got to do something because there's nothing I can do, you know. And so he doesn't know what God's going to do, but as we get towards the end of the chapter, he it's pretty cool. Uh, so um, <clears throat> Romans three twenty five and twenty six is the new covenant answer to Job's outcry. How can a man be right before God? Well, let's see. Read it again here. Uh, <clears throat> Well, and of course, this is right after for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So there you go, Job. You're right. No man can be, you know, you're right, Job. Um, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. All right, there's the answer. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. That's it. Righteous before God. It's through faith in the blood of Jesus. Uh, nothing else. Nothing else will do. Nothing else is good enough. Nothing. Uh, so, through faith in the uh, blood of God, uh, to declare his righteousness. It's a declaration of God, and, and, and our salvation basically is legal terminology. It's a legal declaration uh, from God based on faith in what Jesus has done. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. Do you want to say how you often say it? How it's, um, well, speak faith. louder. Do you want to say it? Because I, I don't know exactly how you say it. What but, am I saying? But how you say like by faith in Jesus' blood and how the different um, times different. had it still the same? I'm not sure like, what you're saying. in the coming Messiah and then in the... Do you know what I'm trying to say? I don't know what he's trying to get to. Or something I say, but... Is it like... 
Is it like, like the, the, it's how faith, salva like, salvation is, and is then by faith? In oh, faith. I know what you're yeah. saying. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. So Ethan's bringing up a point that I often say, <clears throat> and I totally, yeah, I got it now. Um, salvation has, has always been by the same way. Some people teach there's, you know, an old covenant salvation. It's by works, which the Bible clearly says, by works of the law shall no flesh be saved or justified. So the way I say it is um, salvation from the very beginning has always been the same way. By grace, through faith, in the Messiah. In the Old Testament, Going all the way back to before anyone died, Genesis 3.15, there's it, the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, by grace, through faith in the promised and coming Messiah. Now it's by grace, through faith in the already come and coming again Messiah. But it's all by grace, through faith in the Messiah. So, yeah, Job and Adam and anybody in the Old Testament who was saved... It was by grace through faith in, at that point, the promised and coming Messiah. Uh, and it's interesting, God's not in bondage to time. I think it's Revelation 3.18, I think. three. I think it's Revelation 3.18 that says, uh, the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. So in God's economy... The blood of Jesus has been available since before people were even created. You know, God's not in bondage to time. We are, uh, but God's not. So that faith in the Messiah, yeah, it wasn't the same in the Garden of Eden as what we know now, but it was still faith in the Messiah because he was promised in Genesis 3.15, the seed of the woman, um, you know, before anyone died, Abel wasn't dead yet. You know, so before anyone died, redemption was already prophesied. Abel wasn't even born yet. He wasn't even born yet. You're <laughs> right. You're right. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah. So it was before anyone. There, sin had happened, but there had been no physical, no one died yet. Mm -hmm. So they had, a, they had a promise. Matter of fact, I think... When Eve had Cain, if I remember, this was, goes back a long time ago, I studied it. You and remember it was, those days? What? You remember those days? Yeah, sometimes. <laughs> you didn't get what it was. No, I don't get it. <laughs> um, so, uh, but going, going, way, going way back, somewhere along the line when I was studying, when, he, when they named him Cain, the implication was that he was the promise that was given in Genesis 3.15. He wasn't, uh, you know, but it was like, I think if his name means something like, whoa, I got me a man or, or something like that. It was, it, it was, uh, it, that's a different study for a different time, but it was, it was like they thought he was it. Mm -hmm. Well, we know he wasn't, but uh, so anyhow, yeah. All right. So, <clears throat> um, Job laments the impossibility of becoming right before God. Jesus is the fulfillment of that frustration. You know, how can a man be right with God? Uh, <clears throat> my notes, Job suffered more than any man, but he was not more sinful than other people. You know, so he didn't bring it on himself like they wanted, they, they wanted him to believe or like they were accusing him of. Based on God's commentary about Job, if Job was not righteous, who would be? Mm. Yeah, I mean, God said he was the best in all the world. You know, so if Job's not righteous, you know, of course they didn't know God said that. We do. You know, so, I mean, but if Job's not, who is? Really? Yeah, that's kind of what my little note there said. Uh, <clears throat> and, um, oh, we've already kind of talked about it. Somebody wants to look up Galatians 3.16. Um, is, is Job possibly looking 
before the Messiah prophesied in the Garden of Eden. That's Genesis 3.15. I jumped ahead in my notes already. Uh, but Galatians 3.16. Uh, somebody want to read that one when you get it? I'm trying to find it. It's Galatians. Galatians 3.16. were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Scripture does not say and to seeds, meaning many people, but to your, oh, or and to your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. Maybe I should read that again. I did that kind of choppy. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Scripture does not say and to seeds, meaning many people, <clears throat> but, and to your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. So that uh, combined with Genesis 3.15 that we just talked about, this is the first, uh, it's called theological terms, proto-evangelium proto or something like that. It's the first, it's the first, the first evangelism. It's the first yeah. message, uh, first mention kind of of the gospel. And that's, they, they refer to it that way, and it's Genesis 3.15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So even Galatians refers to the promise to Abraham and his seed. Uh, Genesis speaks of the battle between the seed of the woman and Satan and his seed. Uh, and so Jesus is it. So Job most likely knew of this promise to Adam and Eve of the seed of the woman crushing or bruising the seed of the Satan, the serpent. Uh, and then in Galatians, it, it, it speaks of the promise to Abraham and his seed. And Paul, in Galatians, interestingly enough, narrows it down to not a people group, not a huge uh, multitude of uh, related offspring. Paul says, notice how it says seed and not seeds, being singular, being Christ. So Paul specifically points it out to Jesus. So Job could have, to some level, been associating, you know, looking for that promise because he would have, by oral tradition, would have been aware of what took place in Eden. Um, and that promise of the seed of the woman, he could have been, he could have been thinking, we don't know, uh, he could have been thinking, where, where is this person? Where is this promise? You know, uh, it's just food for thought. Um, but he could have been there. He could have been there. So in verse 3 of Job chapter 9, uh, if I will contend with him, he, uh, if, I will, if he will contend with him, he cannot answer him one in a thousand times. So Job's saying, you know, Job knows no one can debate with God or demand answers from him. Um, so at this point, Job says that. Who can, who can debate with God? Who can demand answers from him? It's kind of interesting as we go along, Job actually tries to demand answers from God. He wants, where are you? I want to talk. Well, you know, answer me. You know, answer me. And... Um, as even through this chapter, we see him moving more towards the wish along those lines. Um, and Job uh, verse forty, or Job chapter forty, verses three through five, basically, that's kind of that's where what he says. He says, basically, uh, paraphrase. He says, "I opened my mouth before once. I've spoken twice." 
I'm not going to do it again. <laughs> you know, that's a paraphrase, but that's kind of, you know, he, he gets to the point where he's yeah, kind of demanding answers. It's like, ah, you know, and, and understandably so. And obviously God understands, God rebukes and corrects Job, but he also vindicates Job at the very end, you know, by saying, you know, well, generally speaking, Job was saying the right things about God, whereas his friends were not. Uh, so that's jumping ahead again. But um, so that's verse three. Uh, verse four. He is God. He's speaking again about God. He is wise in heart and mighty in strength. Who hath hardened himself against him and has prospered? Yeah, nobody. Uh, God understands all and he's mighty. Uh, he leaves even the most adept debater dumbfounded. Um, and then with that, I, I got notes. Compare with 1 Corinthians uh, 1, 18 through 21. And basically that's... Uh, the foolishness of this world. God confounds the wisdom of the wise. And his, God, the, the foolishness of God is... It's wiser than the wisdom of man. Yeah, wiser than the wisdom of man. Uh, the Bible doesn't actually say it, but I would say infinitely wiser than the yeah. wisdom of man. You know, <laughs> that word infinitely is not quite there, but in I don't see that as being out of character for God. You know, his... his God's foolishness, if any such thing exists, uh, is infinitely wiser than the wisest person ever. Like sometimes more recently it's come to my mind. Um, God, he knows all my thoughts. I don't have to repeat all my thoughts to him. When I pray, I can but if I want to move along, I, I would avoid that and just focus on the Lord. But but He knows not just my thoughts. He knows yours and yours and yours. And He knows well, everyone in the whole world. At the same time. And, and, he, uh -huh. and he knows the future. And, and uh -huh. He's already taken care of the past. It's like there's no end no. to all of His understanding. And it's like, I'll be... You're okay. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you're in a good. You're in a good place. Yes. It'll be fine in, in the Lord. So mm -hmm. I just I'm overwhelmed. See, because the thing is, at least if I've got my theology right, the devil knows a lot about me. But that's because I open this up and I speak mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. But apparently, yeah. he's not like God. Oh, no. Who knows our thoughts? I always question that because I never seem to have gotten an answer about it. He cannot yeah. read our thoughts. No, I don't believe Satan and can that, read our okay. thoughts. And that makes all present. the difference. And so when I, today, I was focusing on when I do anything out loud, I make sure it's about God, which is true and which, is, which the devil can't handle anyways. Right. But I should avoid blabbing my mouth about anything else because he's constantly listening and he's yeah and so I don't know what this that has in context with what you said but but just how God is infinitely yeah. wiser and, yeah. Yeah. and marvelous so you wrap that up though yeah, and and do I mean words? Yeah. yeah, do be cautious of our words, um, you know, because what the conversation basically is Satan doesn't read minds he can't know what's in our mind but he or his buddies are often almost probably always listening to our words so they can be used by him against us in some way or another uh, and so and the bible speaks regularly about being careful of what we right. say and you know, let no unwholesome word proceed out of your mouth uh, things like that, you know, uh, think whatsoever things are pure and lovely. Think about those things. Well, if we're thinking about those things, we probably should also speak of them. Um, you know, so, yeah, so that's um, that 
how it fits, I'm not sure we're exactly with Job, but, um, well, it does fit with Job because God said Job said what was right about him and Job's yes. friends didn't. So there's definitely a connection, um, you know, and, and so... whatever we say about God that he, that will be any blessing to us, it has to be in spirit and in truth. It has to be, we have to be of the right attitude. But God only receives truth and truth is only in him. And so... Any other, so even like when I was referring to praying, I don't have, I purposely will not expound on all my prayers because I can say, Lord, you know all my thoughts. I commit all my thoughts to you. You and I, we know what we're talking about. But I'm going to say nice and loud all the things that are true about the Lord because, devil, if you're listening, that's going to scare you. And it's interesting, I think. I think it was A. W. I think it was I think it was A. W. Tozer, I, or maybe Leonard Ravenhill. I can't remember. Somebody used to say, "I talk, I talk back to the devil," and um, basically, it's like, you know, re, the, I've heard as others wise said, you know, when whenever Satan re, reminds us of our past, remind him of his future. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's like, yeah, I think you know, tell 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 him all about the blood of Jesus. He won't bother you for long because he'll be he'll be he'll be running, yeah. you know. So, all right. Uh, somebody go to Job chapter thirty nine, and somebody else Job chapter thirty eight. I think these are some, um, and I'll stay in you know Job chapter nine. Whoever's not going to those can just stay in chapter nine. Uh, these are I think some examples of when God says that Job spoke that which is right of him. You know, these are some examples. We're going to take a little comparison. So whoever's in chapter 39, uh, be ready to read verse 8. And then whoever went to ver chapter 38, you got more verses to read. But uh, So I'm going to read verse 5. Uh, 9 5, and then somebody is going to read verse 39, uh, Job 39, verse 8. So 9 5 says, Job's speaking of God, God and his awesomeness, which removes the mountains, and they don't even know it. He overturns them in his anger. All right, who's got 39 8? He explores the mountains for his pasture and searches after every green thing. All right, so Job's using mountains to say God's awesome. And then God, because he's the one speaking in 38, 39, uh, those chapters, then God uses mountains to express his awesomeness. You know, uh, just, just some quick similarities there. Um, in verses, I'll read 6 and 7, and then we'll read some verses uh, from Job 38, a few of them. So 6 and 7 of chapter 9, which shakes the earth out of her place and the pillars thereof tremble, which commands the sun and it rises not and seals up the stars. All right, so 38 verse 4. Yeah. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Oh, I love it. I, I love it. God is God is God is so sarcastic with Job, but Job says is says of God, he shakes the earth out of her place, and he, the pillars thereof tremble. And God's like, Job, come on, you know everything. Answer, where were you when I laid the foundations of the world? All right. So there's verse 4. How about uh, verse 13 of chapter 38? That it might take hold of the ends of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it. Yeah. Okay, so Job's talking about God shaking the earth and God's talking about the wicked being shaken out of the earth. You know, I mean, just some parallels. Uh, mm -hmm. Just some parallels. Uh, verse uh, 18. Uh, thirty-eight, eighteen. Have you understood the expanse of the earth 
Tell me if you know all this. <laughs> Again, back to the earth. <laughs> See, yeah. you know, when you were read the verse about looking for pasture and the green, yeah. I got kind of a visual of like how a shepherd with a sheep, they're, they're traipsing all across the mountain to find where they're going to feed today. Mm -hmm. and, 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 they, and so God, he, he knows it, we're all the different <clears throat> little valleys and little crevices, and, and everything is already about the mountains. Uh -huh. like, um, yeah, we need a GPS for everything. <laughs> <laughs> God knows where the green pastures yeah, are. Yeah, he does. So. Yeah. And but, it is greener on some of the other sides. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> definitely right. greener on God's side. <laughs> All right. Um, 38, 24, I think these verses start talking about the sun and the stars and things like that. 24? Yeah. By what way is light diffused, or the east wind scattered over the earth? Okay, read Sounds 20. Like a science read, book. read 26 again. Oh, yeah. The light diffused. Yeah, yeah. That, I mean, the Bible's not a science book, but what it says is sci what it says is scientifically accurate. You know, it's not. It doesn't teach. It's not a science textbook, but what it says is scientifically accurate. Of course, now with Job, it's also poetic. So you got to keep in mind taking that into account. But so, okay, read verse twenty six as well. To cause it to rain on a land where there is no one, a wilderness in which there is no man. Okay, uh, so God. He takes care of things even when there's no person there to take care of. You know, he's got it. He's got it all under control. The remote and, parts of the earth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, verse uh, 33 of chapter 38. Some of this we'll go over again when we get to those chapters. But 33. Do you know the ordinances of the heavens, or fix their rule over the earth? Okay, so there's some reference to the stars and the oh, moon and all of that. Yeah, no, God's real sarcastic. Okay, I'm going to read verses 8 and 9, and then we got one more verse in Job 38. So um, <clears throat> Job 9, 8 and 9, which alone spreads out the heavens and treads upon the waves of the sea, which makes Arcturus, Orion, and the Pleiades, uh, and the chambers of the south. Okay, somebody, uh, Job 38, verse 31. Can you bind the cluster of the Pleiades or loose the belt of Orion? All right, there you go. Two of the uh, uh, same. So Job's, ta Job's talking about the constellations and God's kind of sarcastically correcting him with regards to the constellations. You know, you think God heard what Job was saying? <laughs> and actually in this, in this, I think it's this chapter, Job even kind of says, well, if he answered me, I wouldn't believe he was even listening. And we'll, I think we'll see that in this chapter. Well, God's obviously listening because he does answer and he addresses many of the points Job brings up along the way. Um, and Job says, yep, I opened my mouth once, and yeah, I even opened it twice, and I only got two feet to stick in there, so I'm not doing it again. Uh, you know, that's the Bob paraphrase again. Don't quote that as scripture. Uh, you know, so, um, so that's uh, eight and nine. Um, verse 10, let's see. Chapter nine, verse ten. I think we're I think we're done with thirty eight and thirty nine now. Uh, those chapters, a uh, few verses out of there. Um, verse ten of Job nine. Who does great things past finding out? Yes, and wonders without number. So Job's still singing God's praises and the accolades. He does great things we can't even understand. They're beyond finding out, um, and. Uh, you know, uh, the wonders, we can't even count them, you know. So, um, <clears throat> actually, my little note here, we're not, and obviously we're not going to go there right now, but 
God's rebuke of Job in chapters 38 through 40 are largely reflective of this one verse, and we just got a little taste of that, you know. Uh, Job, come on, you're wise, you know all these things. Where were you when I did this? Can you say to the seas, your waves come this far and no farther? You know, can you do that, Job? You know, so uh, God's response, this one verse, a lot of God's response kind of is reflective of this one verse. And Job says the right thing. God does great things beyond finding out uh, and, and wonders without number. And then Job proceeds to try and find out why, 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 you know, all of that. So verse 11 Lo, he goes by me, and I see him not. He passes on also, but I perceive him not. So, <clears throat> my notes, God is beyond comprehension. He does what he wants, even allowing suffering. Kind of my little note there. Um, somebody want to look up 1 Corinthians 2.16? Because Job says he's beyond comprehension. Who, you know, he goes by, I don't even know he's there. I don't perceive him, I don't get it, I don't know, uh, I don't know anything, you know. And, uh, but then we get to the new covenant, who's got it? Yeah. Okay. For who, 2.16 you said? Yeah, 1 Corinthians 2.16, yeah. yeah. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. And just, just to point out, this where it says, in, in my version, it says, who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him. It's all in caps. Uh -huh. It's probably a quote, maybe from Job or maybe from the Psalm, I can't remember. But usually if it's all caps, it's a quote from the Old Covenant. Um, and it probably if you look in your margin or something, it'll tell you where it's from. It's... I don't think it's a direct quote from Job, but it's it's reflective of what oh, we're talking it about. It says Isaiah, Romans, and oh, John. Okay, so probably he's probably a direct quote from Isaiah. Right. So Job is like, you know, God's beyond comprehension. We can't, we don't even know he's there. He passes. I don't perceive him. I don't know anything. But in the new covenant, now we have access to the mind of Christ. We can know anything and everything God wants us to know. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> we're not going to know everything we because can't handle it. Well, yeah, we'd explode probably. It. Yeah, <laughs> we'd explode. You know, uh, if we knew everything God knew, like Caldina was going to say, He knows everything. Everybody's thinking everything. They need everything. They want everything. They've ever done everything. They ever will do everything. 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 I mean, if we if we just did that, if we just knew all, I mean, I can't remember things I actually lived in the past, things I, I did. I don't remember driving here today. I mean, God. you know, so it's like we just couldn't handle it. But everything we need to know, we can, we act, can access because we can and we do have access to the mind of Christ. Um, the problem with not understanding what God wants me to understand is me. You know, uh, the problem with not hearing what God is saying is found in the mirror. You know, I'm the problem, not God. You know, so we have access to the mind of Christ. Job, he's like, I, I don't even know, you know, he goes by. Maybe he did. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know anything, you know. Um, so, again, a little, little hinting maybe at, you know, what might, what, what, maybe a hint of what needs to happen from Job's perspective. And maybe that's why God said, Job said what was right about him, things like this. Whereas Job's friends were like, you're an idiot, you're wrong, you, you know. So... Job speaking well of God, his friends try to speak well of God, but they use what they say to put the blame on Job. God doesn't pervert justice, so Job, you're guilty. Job just is like, God 
does it. He's just. He's holy. He does what he wants. He's God. And, and I've kind of felt that, okay, here you're saying that Job's friends are trying to accuse Job or put some kind of blame on him or whatever. But I, and I've often thought that when people do that, ultimately their accusations are pointed to God. Oh, yeah. But they're using the, the person yeah. as an excuse to, to make their blame. But they, to, but they, to direct, justify themselves. I was just going yeah. to say that to justify yeah. what they've done. Yeah. yeah. Right. Or, or, not, or, not, or not even that. It's just right. they, they, their heart is actually against God, but they wouldn't dare yeah. say yeah, it yeah, openly yeah. to everyone. Mm. So now they've got to pick who here can I the direct this blame right. to right back to the Garden of Eden. Kind of, kind of like that. The woman that you gave me. Yeah. yeah, right back to the Garden of Eden. The woman you gave me. Wasn't me, it was that serpent. You know? Everybody's putting the blame on somebody else. So yeah, right back they to the garden. Threw them under the bus. Oh, they oh yeah. <laughs> right from the very first sin. The right from the very first yeah. I didn't even have chariots in the garden, but, uh, you know, maybe under the elephant's foot. You know, I don't know. Just, I don't know. But anyhow, yeah, exactly. Um, all right, verse 12. This, this sounds kind of funny. What? Verse 12, may I read it? Yeah, go ahead. If he snatches away, who can stop him? Who can say to him, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah. So my note on that is no one, no one is able or qualified to go to call God into account. God, what are you doing? Uh, yeah, like I'm going to answer to you. Maybe if I want to, but you got no authority to call me to. And I can, my notes, I compare that with in Job 1 and 2, where the angels went to present themselves before God and Satan was with them, they're, they're there giving an account. And the first thing, you know, God orders a response from Satan and Satan hop twos and gives them the response. Now, God can order accountability from everyone and, and does and will, you know. Ultimately, in the final judgment, every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess and, you know, you're going to be accountable. Your sins are going to your sins are going to be paid for. You're either going to have received the payment that Jesus already paid for your sins, or you're going to pay them yourself. Mm. And all of eternity in hell is not going to be good enough to satisfy the debt. Mm. So I highly recommend. But it has been paid by Jesus. It has been paid. Mm. The, the, his he's. Died. He's the propitiation, not for well, our sins, but for the right. yeah, but for the sins of the whole world. So you're either you either accept the payment that's been made, or you say no, I'm going to do it myself. And you'll and fail it'll, it'll the whole be time. In vain. It'll, well, you, uh, you'll be spending all of eternity in torment in hell. I don't care what any of the popular preachers say. Uh, because it's very popular these days to a lot of so-called Christians are preaching Jehovah's Witness annihilationism uh, that, you know, you're burned up and in some short period of time you cease to exist. So basically that doctrine, which is straight from the pit of hell, uh, you know, I've shared the gospel with enough people to know that most of them don't believe in hell or the devil. So I'm not going to join them. When the Bible says the smoke of their torment uh, goes up forever and ever, you know, I believe it. So by believing annihilationism, you're saying that the blood of Jesus is good enough to satisfy my debt for sin, and my annihilation is equally good enough to satisfy my debt for sin. What a dragging Jesus down into the dirt! To say that I can be annihilated and pay my debt for sin equally like Jesus' blood? Yeah. Oh, no. Don't get me started, people. <laughs> you know, that you, if you believe that, you're dragging my Savior's name into the mud. And I'm not going to stand for it. 
oh, and worse than that, he's not going to stand for it. Mm. Whether you get me mad or not, it's not going to mean nothing to you. But if you make God mad, you're going to pay. So don't teach that garbage. Don't believe that garbage. Yeah, anyhow, that's not quite in Job, but, you know, hey, we went there, I'll go there. So uh, you got to believe the truth, man. You, uh, and, and, and people do all kinds of, I call it mental gymnastics, to make the Bible say the opposite of what it says. It's like, really? Anyhow, they're I could... Deceived. Yeah, yeah. They're de they're de deceived. They pick and choose. A pick and choose. Said, like, it's like a buffet. They yep. pick and choose what they want to believe. Yep, pick and choose. I mean, well, I, I'm going to get on with Job. I, <laughs> the examples come flowing to my mind. Uh, but that, yeah, pick and choose. Cherry pick what you want to believe. And, and, I, and, and I've seen it. One sentence... They'll demand the first half of the sentence and reject the second half of the sentence. And I'll just give the one quick example is people who demand you keep the Sabbath. Exodus 31, uh, verse 14. The first part of the sentence says, uh, keep the Sabbath uh, for it's holy unto the Lord. And then there's a semicolon. And then it says, all violators shall surely be put to death. So those that tell me to keep the Sabbath, I ask, how many people have you put to death recently? It's one sentence, at least in a lot of translations. Some translations make it two sentences, but in any case, one or two sentences are one, right? Oh, and then two verses later, it says this is a perpetual covenant in verse 16. So talk about picking cherries, man. Anyhow, didn't really want to go there, but... I'll somebody go. Needed to hear it. Yeah, somebody needed to hear it. Uh, okay, verse 13, um, <clears throat> chapter 9, verse 13. If God will not withdraw his anger, the proud helpers uh, do stoop under him. So uh, I think when Ethan read it, the word proud is not there. Uh, Rahab, it says. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... I wanted to look that up because I personally believe the book of Job was written first before any other book in the Bible. Can I read my translation? Yep. This is the NIV. Mm -hmm. God does not restrain his anger. Even the cohorts of Rahab cowered at his feet. Okay, so... The cohorts of... So, so if... if is he guys that Rahab would entertain? Is that what it is? No. Means? It's, no. So, nope, it's not. When we get to, I, look, I purposely looked it up because I was like, wait a second, if this is Rahab, then this was written after Joshua. It does say Rahab in that. Yeah. But, oh, I know, I know, I looked it up. Uh, I looked it up, and in the Hebrew, um, some translations use the Hebrew word Rahab, but this is not a reference to Rahab the harlot. It's a different Hebrew word with similar meanings. Uh, but it does not mandate that the book of Job was written after the book of Joshua. What did so, you find about this use of Rahab? Uh, basically he, proud. He looked at his footnotes and it's um, interesting. My footnote says um, in Job 9.13, a sea monster, not to be confused with Rahab and Joshua too. Okay. All right. I didn't see the when I looked it up. I didn't see about the sea monster, but it's not wouldn't be surprising to me. It also, wouldn't be too far fetched for Job for Job because I have an American standard. Yeah, yeah. It also wouldn't be too far off for Job, the Book of Job, because in forty it talks about yeah. Leviathan and Behemoth. We've already spoken briefly about Leviathan in an, in an earlier chapter, which we didn't get too much into because I know it's. Coming up, the yeah. Leviathan and Behemoth. Does crouch the helpers of Rahab. Yeah. yeah. So anyhow, my the big thing I wanted to point out here is it's it's more of a pride thing, but I to me it was like Rahab. Okay, wait so, a second, you know. So, so could this animalistic creature kind of be like, and they've got a pet name for it, Rahab? Maybe like they called it Rahab, kind of like the Leviathan. 
sort of. I don't think it's. I don't think I don't it's a pet name. It, it no, basically means name. proud or maybe yeah. arrogant, something like that. Uh, the sea monster thing I didn't come across, but uh, that's kind of interesting. So I don't really have an answer for that. It can also possibly be like a similar word that they didn't know what yeah. translation for. Well, Rahab. I mean, it's very similar. Rahab. The name of the harlot and this Rahab, they're, they're very similar. They're associated Hebrew words, but they have slightly different meanings, too. So, um, Job, Job 3, verse 8, refers to something like that. May those who curse days curse that day those who are ready to rouse Le- Leviathan. Yeah, that was the earlier reference. So it seems to be he's sometimes making mention of these creatures. So oh, yeah. It's actually kind of a creature. Like, yeah, maybe. Uh, you know, it's just it's, uh, what I got out of it when I looked was basically the pride aspect, you know. Um, maybe it's kind of like both that, like the sea creature is kind of like a sort of proud ish yeah, kind yeah. of creature. Yeah, yeah. Like it, and it had, I don't know, maybe it has helpers. It, it could but, be. That could make some sense. Like when it talks about Leviathan, it's, the description is of a beast that certainly could be arrogant. You know, it's like almost untouchable when you read the, the, this description of him when we get to him. So, I mean, as invincible as he appears to be, certainly arrogance and pride could co- seem to go along with that. Another question I have is, is it, is it made actually talking about Leviathan with that? With this like, particular? Have, no, I think... Because the, the Leviathan is also a sea creature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the reference in Job 3 I, it uses the actual word for Leviathan. Yeah. This is a different word. So it, so it's either probably likely to be a different creature or and or pride yeah. as well. Yeah. yeah Rahab's mentioned again in chapter 26. Okay. Yeah, well, I guess when we get there, we'll see. Yeah. I'll look it up and make sure it's a diff- the same word that's here. I'm we sure it probably is. is. Yeah. It's not because it, then it talks about serpent. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, I mean, there, there could definitely be an association there. Um, Job is speaking in chapter 9, these past verses, about, about the challenge of, you know, confronting God in any mm-hmm. way. And as if it's the hardest thing to do. But it's, and then it seems... That maybe he's like comparing this this creature as hard as it is to deal with that kind of creature, and nobody's able to deal with that. That that has been like all these warriors and all these <clears throat> strong men in those ancient days. That was like their their ultimate goal to capture the, that creature, and he's kind of comparing, trying to. Like you can't wrestle with God, you can't outdo Him. You you don't you can't even tell when He's coming by or this or that. And if He snatches something from you, you can't tell Him. Oh, don't you do that? It's like as I kind of get it maybe that He's comparing oh, all yeah. of that challenge yeah, yeah. with yeah. this this possible um, um, like a, a nickname. For this pet animal, um, not as pet, not pet. this monstrous animal, um, <laughs> they call it Rahab. Yeah, it, huh. yeah. I mean, it's obviously a connection with the sea creature. I mean, yeah. there. Or she just read from twenty six, I think, yeah. chapter twenty six, yeah. and so there's definitely some kind of a connection there. It's definitely a different word than Leviathan, mm-hmm. but so it's either maybe another reference to that beast or a different sea beast, you know. Uh, but the arrogance is what I got from it in this situation. I have a question. Yep. Yeah. Was Rahab um, Rahab's, like, Canaanite name, or did she take that name as a Hebrew? I don't know. We're that's doing the book of Job. Topic. I know. No, but that's but a good question. This good word question. is, like, a Canaanite word. That might be why they didn't, like... This word that is used for this Z monster, the Canaanite word, they might not have known how to translate it because it's not Hebrew. Could be. I didn't look that up. Uh, that's a good oh, question. Yeah. That's a good question. Uh huh. Yeah. And 
to my, the and my Holy and my Jesus. phone for looking these things up is being used right now. So <laughs> you know, um, but yeah, no, there's a lot of good questions about this, yeah. and I mean, it, I don't know. I when I looked it up. There were two different Hebrew words, but I didn't see. I didn't pay attention to the if the origin was. It, well, at this point, it wouldn't, wouldn't have, have been Canaanite because sure. the Canaanites right. didn't even exist yet. Well, that's right. So, so anyhow, uh, not. No, the Canaanites would exist because the Canaanites are the children of Cain, right? Oh, no. Uh, no. Uh, no. No. The Canaanites were the children of Cain. Yeah, I don't. Isn't it one of Abraham's sons set or something? No, I think the the Canaanites came after Abraham. Abraham, I believe. You guys are making me think too much here. (laughs) (laughs) So, but I just googled it. What did it say? Um, Rahab, Hebrew, uh, uh, Tiberian, Rahab, blusterer used in the Hebrew Bible indicate pride or arrogance, like you said, a mystical sea monster as an emblematic or poetic name for Egypt. And okay. Oh. Yeah, I mean, that, that's probably referring to another passage of scripture where that same word's used. Oh, it's written. The next one refers to Job. And Egypt in the same sentence? No. Oh, okay. No. I was going to say, because Job was definitely before Egypt in my mind. Yeah. Um, what I'm kind of wondering is maybe Egypt's emblem was the Rahab creature, and maybe that's why that was referenced in what you just looked up. Because like, maybe they, like, because how different, like, military groups would have, like, an emblem on there for their mm. oh. military okay. group. Okay. So maybe Egypt's was that. Rahab creature, whatever it was. Oh my goodness, could be. Huh. I don't know. Uh, I think we've gotten pretty far. If it, if it, yeah, we <laughs> no, got a little off. Topic. We got a little <laughs> off topic. Same topic, but um, different topic. <laughs> so, but if if Egypt did use it in some kind, it was because of previous because of, because of yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Like wow. All right, are we ready to but, go but on? Ray, but Rahab is the Hebrew name. So that, yeah. that is Egyptian a Hebrew. Or Egyptian origins. Or origins. origins. Yeah, okay. Alrighty. Alright. So. Next question. Yeah. <laughs> ah, okay, do we go on the next section? Job. Yeah. Yeah, it's seven already. Okay. So next week, we will start... I knew we weren't going to get through Job 9. I didn't know we were going to spend that much time on Rahab. But uh, <laughs> but uh, so next week we'll start with uh, Job 9, 14 uh, and see if we maybe can finish the chapter next week. I don't know. It's a fairly long chapter and the end is the best part. So we may not finish it next week either. Um, but... Uh, yeah, Job 9, a lot of powerful stuff, and now I guess I have to go and look some more stuff up on Rahab if I think about it when I get home. Uh, so, uh, all right, well, thanks for those who joined us on Facebook and those who came, and uh, Lord willing, we'll see you next week. All right, bye-bye.